Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Flying Cat Marketing Interview Series. Today, I'm really excited to have Aaron Balsa on. Aaron has led content teams for seven years, first as a managing editor at a content marketing agency, and then as head of content and marketing director at a high-growth B2B SaaS company called The Predictive Index. In January, Erin went out on her own, started her own consulting content marketing business called Erin Balsa Content Marketing. She is founder and chief picky editor at Erin Balsa Content Marketing, where she works with B2B companies whose content needs mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Some companies she's worked with and written for include HubSpot, Drift, G2, Bamboo HR, Zenefits, Showpad, Intellum, Shinesty, and Metadata. She's known for her bold and edgy writing style, and she lives by the mantra, B2B doesn't have to be boring. I think we can all agree to that. And she's also obsessed with data-driven storytelling. In September, she launched her first course on Gumroad, the research report playbook, which I also purchased and absolutely loved. And in it, she walks through the exact playbook she uses to create marketing research reports, like the 2020 remote work report, which drove more than 500,000 in revenue so far. Today, we're going to be talking about content marketing metrics and balancing hand raisers, high intent leads with low intent leads. Hello, Erin. How's it going? Going good. I'm so glad that you got the memo and that we're matching today. I just yeah. know this conversation is going to just go excellent just based on I mean, the wardrobe choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those Thanks who are for having with me. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you for joining me. I was just going to say for those who are listening, we are wearing the same hoodie. <laughs> yes, we are. Because, you know, similar mindset here. We have the same train of thought on a lot of things. We've talked a lot in the past and it's good to, you know, see you again and have another conversation. Absolutely. I've been very excited to have you on. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about metrics, high intent leads, MQLs, all of that fun stuff. Slowly but surely, businesses, I think, are starting to get the memo, moving away from MQL only model saying we need leads, leads, and they're focusing more on SQOs, sales qualified leads, uh, sales qualified opportunities, and hand raisers. Where do you think this shift happened? And how's the landscape for marketing and the kind of leads we're expected to, to deliver changing? I can speak about the actual history of it. I know that it's something that was a term originally thrown about the MQL is a dying thing back in like 2017. So we're already about five years into this shift. It's just getting more and more adoption and traction over the last few years. I'm sure a lot of the listeners know that Drift put out uh, an ebook a few years ago. I think it was like 2019 that talked about switching from the dated MQL model and focusing less on leads and more about conversations. There's a lot of reasons why this is the case. I can just speak from my own experience, the shift that I have seen maybe three or four years ago, working with companies, it was all about putting individual eBooks behind a form and something in my gut, I knew it wasn't right because I didn't like that. And as a writer, a lot of what we do is search the internet for data and sources. And a lot of the times that is gated. So we're filling out email, filling out forms, getting these assets sent to us as writers all the time, probably much more than the average person who doesn't have to constantly be looking for sources. And a lot of times what happens is the ebook is really underwhelming and you have this bad experience and then you start getting phone calls because this form has you give your, your name and your phone number and your email address and A lot of times, especially when you're, maybe you don't work in marketing, maybe you don't really see a lot of this. You don't know to give a fake phone number. So you start getting assaulted by sales reps in your phone. Now they're texting you. It is just an assault on your privacy. And all you wanted to do was just download a piece of content. And that is really the experience that people were starting to see more and more. Certain professions, certain industries saw it first because they were the ones probably searching for the most information, downloading most content, getting the most invasive calls. So now we're realizing this sucks for me. Oh, wow. This is how our customers and our prospects must feel. Let's do something about it. So from my own experience, coming from a company where we were doing that at first, and we knew it was inherently wrong, 
you have numbers to hit. You have investors that want to see you hit a certain amount of revenue per month. And if you just take off all the forms, you're not giving enough leads to the sales team. And if they're not having enough of those conversations, what are we going to do? So now there's a shift toward creating those conversations, removing the forms where you can. Doesn't mean that tomorrow you can just go and wipe every form off of your site and expect everything to just go smoothly. It's about a gradual transition, finding ways to what I say, gate strategically or strategic gating. And I wouldn't say that the MQL is dead yet because there are a lot of companies that still do put individual forms in front of a lot of eBooks. A lot of people are starting to find smarter ways to gate and maybe eventually it will be dead. I'd say that we're still in a transitional period. And I'd say that a lot of people, I think, know what they should be doing. They're just not quite able to do that yet. So they're stuck in like a purgatory or a limbo. A gating limbo. A gating limbo. I feel like not gating content or strategic gating is also going to influence the way that you're thinking about that ebook, the way that you're thinking about the value that you're going to provide in it, rather than just hiding behind a form that once they fill it out, you've got what you need. How, how do you such, take it? Yeah. Such a great point. I'm so glad you said that. Because in the past when I you know, was working with companies and it was about, hey, we got to put out three gated assets a week because we need to have this much content to get this many people into our ecosystem so that we can make this many calls. Because if we make this many dials, even at our very abysmally low conversion rate from a low content lead, a low intent content lead to a quo, we got to do it. We got to get those leads. Yeah, you were just trying to, it's like the old fashioned SEO where you were like getting as many blogs out as you could, even if they were crappy, you just had to stuff those keywords in. And the same kind of mentality takes form a lot of times with the gated content and the eBooks and just trying to get anything out there. And it doesn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily worthy of a gate. So I love that you said that. I think that if you're ever contemplating gating content, that you need to make sure it's something that you would be comfortable giving your own information for, or maybe even paying for. And that can be a good litmus test if you really wanna get your gated content to the next level. Is it worth your money? Would you actually benefit in a way that if you had paid $20 or $50 or $150, would you think that was worth your investment? And that's the kind of content companies should be gating. Absolutely. And it's really at that point being brutally honest with yourself. Because <laughs> so I think sometimes, I think everybody knows when they look at a piece of content they created, whether it truly provides value or not. And some people, they know deep inside they're in denial. And it's about having that real conversation with yourself. Why even go after low intent leads? Why don't we just get rid of them altogether? Why shouldn't we just focus on high intent leads, hand raisers? I think we should focus on high intent leads and hand raisers. I think that should be our focus. Making sure that we are getting people as much as possible so bought in, so engaged, so persuaded, so hungry for our help and assistance and partnership that they do raise their hands. That takes time. So I think that in the meantime, you do have to be getting a certain number of leads over to your sales team so that they can have these conversations. And so what I like to look at is the split between our high intent hand raisers, because we know okay, awesome. If these people raise their hand because they want to have a conversation, they want a software demo, they want to become a partner, cool. That's going to convert to a sales qualified opportunity at 35%. That's great. Whereas if I have a low intent lead that didn't raise their hand and we're just calling on them and assuming that they're ready, those are only going to convert at say 2% to a sales qualified opportunity. That's a lot more work on the sales team. It's a lot more of their time and their labor. It's very demotivating to be the person who's making all those calls and just it's getting hung up on all day long doesn't feel good. So the more that we can as a unit, not just marketing versus sales, but come together to create this content. So every month we might not be meeting our perfect desired high intent hand raiser goal. That's okay. As long as we are trending in the right direction. So let's say I have my models and my predictions, and I know that 
If we can hit 100 high intent hand raiser leads this month, that sales will have the right number of people to talk to and have these conversations with so that they can meet their numbers. However, we're seeing that we're trending at only 50 hand raiser leads that are high intent. So what am I gonna do to make up the difference? There's a few different levers I can pull. And some of the ones that are organic uh, may take longer. So yeah, I'm still gonna do those things in hopes that next month I'm gonna have 55 high intent hand raiser leads. But I need to make up the difference. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna put form in front of something. Hopefully it's not an individual ebook. Hopefully I might host a webinar. A lot of people don't mind filling out a form to attend a webinar that is interactive. I might put out a report or some other form of big content, and that might be a way to get people into the ecosystem so that we do meet our total SQO number, which we need to hit. I'm curious, when you first joined the predictive index, did they have this mentality or did you have to get buy-in? Did you have to convince people to shift the way that you're bringing leads in? No, like I said, I've been at the Predictive Index for several years now. And when I first came, we were still doing gated content and we knew it wasn't right. And we could see it on paper. I might my accent coming out. We could see it on paper and we could see that people loved our content and people were downloading it left and right. And month over month, content was our number one lead type, which is great, except for we were calling them too soon and they weren't ready. So we did have to put together a fundamental shift in, in that and make some big changes. And we did. So now we no longer do that. We have moved the last few years to strategic gating model and it's a lot better. In fact, last year uh, we saw our high intent lead types increase by more than 100%. So they more than wow. doubled in 2021, which is really great because we are putting all this effort into making the experience better, making sure that even if we are bucketing these more low intent leads, we're at least looking for intent signals before we pass it to sales. We're not just saying form filled, here you go, sales, they're marketing qualified. We're not doing that. Okay. So what does it look like actually strategic gating? The purpose of that is I, I, in your LinkedIn content, from what I understand, you put the key takeaways, you prepare a blog post so that anybody can actually access that data. Other people, if they want to, can download the report. What kind of lead is that considered? Do they go continue getting nurtured through email? Do those leads get passed on to sales? Or how does that whole lead structure work with strategic gating? Great question. I can give you two examples. Example one, you had just mentioned reports. We do four reports a year. So for example, yeah, let's say that we have this big report with 50 findings in it, and we write a blog post and we you know, write it about three of the findings. And then we say, hey, would you like to read the report? So we're pushing them into the report. We do also ungate part of the report. So we're not putting the entire thing behind a form. We're giving people um, some of it, even if they don't want to fill out the form. But a lot of them do, which is great. And then we put you into a cadence. So we have different email nurtures and cadences. We also do some retargeting and that works really well. So for example, just so you can see a, like an actual user journey and how this plays out. Someone first landed on the PI site via an SEO blog. And in that blog, they clicked the CTA to sign up for Learn, which is number two that I'm going to talk about in a minute. They poked around, they looked at some courses, and ultimately they just forgot about us and they ghosted us and didn't come back for a while. We retargeted them. Now, so once we had their email address from Learn, we retargeted them by sharing a report with them. They saw it. They said, oh, the predictive index. I remember them. And then they went back into Learn, took some courses, and then raised their hand to have a demo. So that's how it really works in terms of getting them in the system, using retargeting. And then number two would be the, the proprietary learning center that we built. So... Rather than just have static, passive content, we wanted to really provide interactive content experiences as much as possible. So for example, if someone is reading a blog about employee engagement, if they were really interested in understanding our unique take on it, which is that there's an aptitude of this discipline called talent optimization, where you can really 
use behavioral people data to impact employee engagement. So if you'd like to learn about that, why don't you sign up for Learn? We have this gigantic learning center. We have eBooks and templates and courses and original data. It's all in there for you. Fill out this form once and you'll never have to fill out a form again. That's pretty high value. Yeah. And a lot of people do not have a problem with that. And once they do that, we're not calling them. We're putting them into a learn cadence. So okay. we're trying to understand what kind of content are they interested in? What is their, what do they do? Are they an HR leader? Are they a business executive? Are they a consultant who does executive coaching? Who is this person? And how can we serve up the right content so that they are getting, you know, pushed along in their journey so that when the timing is right, they raise their hand and want to talk to us. That's ultimately what we want to do. So is this a personalized learning center? They fill in the form providing this information that you said, or they're clicking about in the learning center and you deliver them personalized learning materials based on their job roles and goals? We're getting better and better over time. We're not in our dream state yet. That's okay. We've already made a ton of progress. So for example, let's say I sign into the learning center and I say, yes, I'm a consultant you know what, I'm not gonna give you the leader talent optimization certification. I'm gonna give you yeah. the consultant talent optimization certification. So we are starting to get smarter with what content we serve up. But of course, this isn't something that happens overnight. It's a huge lift. So it's something that we aim to get better at over time. It's so valuable to do it that way. And of course, I could picture certain C-levels or executives that would have a hard time buying it still because they're so they're saying I need leads I need leads I need leads but this yeah. provides so much more value yeah and then people and you can do both here. yeah you can have this and this is going to take time you're not going to get what you need overnight but you know what why don't you do what a lot of companies do which is put out a content piece to a cold audience with a LinkedIn lead gen form get your low intent leads that way there's all different mechanisms you can do so if you've sworn off gating individual content pieces on your site Okay, so there are other ways to gate individual content pieces if you absolutely have to. Yeah. Or like I said, you could do some webinars. We've had a lot of success with webinars. Mm. So you've already named a few, but I'm interested if you can share a specific content play that you either used at the Predictive Index or elsewhere with other companies that you've worked with and what you did. What was your strategy hypothesis? I know you have a whole e-course about it that we could just buy. <laughs> and maybe you're not going to talk about the research report, but I'm curious about your best content play. Yeah, I wouldn't say this is my best content play because I've already talked about a few that work really well for us, but I can share another one that is a form of strategic gating. So we have done thematical campaigns. So for example, let's say we're doing a thematical campaign with tons of different content about the Great Retention, which is something that we came out with in response to the Great Recession. All these employees are quitting, and this is a huge pain point for our audience. You know what? We have this new way for you to retain your employees, and we have a course, and we have this report that we put out that talks about this, and we have a bunch of blog posts, and we have videos. So we would build a splash page, which is just essentially an HTML page, and above the fold, we are merchandising all of our best content on this topic. And then below the fold, once you scroll down, you have the opportunity to sign up for a webinar on the topic or sign up to take this courses. You have all this great content for free, but we're also pushing you to gated content so that we can get you in our ecosystem if you're not already there. If you are, if you previously filled out a form, you can just go right into that content and start taking the course. You don't have to fill out the form again. So that's a, a form of strategic gating as well. What, what would you call that? It's like a mini course? I call it a splash page and I don't even know if there is a better terminology. That's just what I call it. So th this is all content that you have already created and you are curating it and putting it together for a specific purpose? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes we might be curating existing content, but a lot of times we're creating some new content as well. Let's say we know that right now a hot trending topic is hiring engineers. And we know that a lot of our clients are trying to hire engineers. Maybe we have a whole splash page and we already have a course on hiring for hard to fill positions. It doesn't specifically talk about engineers, but it's still relevant. Yeah. We're going to include that. It's already existing. So it's not a lift for us. And then we're going to marry that with maybe a blog post that specifically talks about hiring engineers and 
a template that they can use for different interview questions that they could ask when hiring engineers. Beautiful. Love it. What was your hypothesis when doing this the first time and how did that match up to the results? Gosh, so I don't necessarily know. I can't give you a good answer for this specific um, use case just because we do these every now and again. And I, I don't have any data with me off the top of my head. But I would say that it works pretty well because, like I said, we've always known that people love our content. People share it. People stay this long time on page. They do interact with our content for the most part. So I would say we're accomplishing two goals of giving away helpful information that our audience cares about to help them solve their biggest challenges right now. That's a win. And that's a win for our clients and our customers too, because content's not just for getting people into your ecosystem to become a customer. Yeah. Content's also for helping your customers solve their biggest problems. And we do find that our customers do read our content. They do download our reports. They do come to our conferences and our webinars. They do still want that help and that support. So. I would say it's a win-win in terms of not only our you know, bottom line marketing metrics, but also customer retention and expansion. And I think of it that way too. So I don't have data or numbers off the top of my head for splash pages, but they do work and they do get viewed and shared and consumed. I love it. I am going to make one now because that sounds <laughs> a really cool idea. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So what are the next steps for you? What, what kind of customers are you going to be working with over the next few months? So I have a few anchor clients that are some long-term relationships. B2B SaaS companies, that's really been a sweet spot for me, which honestly, it's funny because I, 10 years ago, was a, a magazine editor. I edited content for four monthly print magazines, and it was all about where to eat, where to drink, where to shop, like what's the cool places to go in the city. And then I found myself in this content marketing agency managing the lifestyles and education team. It's really fun. The writers that are writing about beauty and makeup and home interiors and all this fun, easy breezy stuff. And there was another manager who was managing the technology team. And I remember thinking, oh, I would hate to be managing that. That must be so hard. I could never do that. Lo and behold, I got moved to manage technology as well. And I found out through a lot of editing, I could do this. I did have the capacity to understand technology and maybe not data migration and really intense technology, but I can understand a lot of software. And I have been doing that ever since. And I love it. I absolutely love it. And so I'm working with some companies. I specialize in marketing sales and HR. So any kind of software that pertains to those three verticals is my sweet spot. Love it. Everybody get in touch with Erin. She is a glorious marketer. And I also highly recommend anybody who's listening to get the research report playbook if you are trying to get into that strategic gating. Erin, thank you so much for your time. This has been a lovely conversation. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. It was great to see you again. So thanks for inviting me on. Absolutely. And everybody who is watching or listening, if you enjoyed this, please let us know. Give it a like, share it, leave a comment, say hi to me and Erin, and also connect with Erin on LinkedIn. She is consistently providing high value content on there. I've learned a lot from her. Really enjoy following you, Erin. And thanks for listening, everybody. Have a yeah, thanks for listening. Bye, everyone.